What about Vietnam? A podcast with Gary Newsom. The series where Gary talks with travelers about their experiences and adventures. Find out more about Vietnam from the people who have actually been there. What about Vietnam? Whether it's adventure, exploring the culture and cuisine, shopping, or just soaking up the sun. Let Carrie and her travellers pave the way for a magical holiday in Vietnam. What about Vietnam? Xin chào and welcome to What About Vietnam. If there's one thing I know about travel, that is that we all love to take photographs. We all want to record that beautiful journey that we've had to that special place. Today, I'm going to be talking to someone who knows a lot about this subject as he runs uh, his own uh, photo tours all through Southeast Asia. But in particular, his favorite spot is Vietnam. Etienne Bassot joins us today from Hoi An and he opens our discussion with a little bit about what's happening in Vietnam amid the, the COVID crisis and the upsurge in a second wave as we're recording this in uh, August 2020. We didn't want to get too stuck on that, but it was good to hear from Etienne, just a little bit of the background to what's been going on with COVID and how Vietnam has handled it so valiantly up until now and still goes on to uh, to really get it under control as uh, the centre point is in Da Nang, very close to Hoi An. More about Etienne uh, in the sense that Etienne uh, does offer some fantastic tours throughout Southeast Asia. He's been doing this for over 13 years. He specialises in people photography. And there certainly is an art to taking people uh, photography seriously and and an art to, to getting it right and doing it in a way that from both you as the photographer and the person you're taking the photograph of are both very happy about the outcome. He will share with us some of the best places, his top five best places to to visit in Vietnam, and we're going to get lots of tips and hints about how to to take great photos. Uh, Please welcome Etienne to the show. Hello, Etienne. How are you? Hi, I'm very fine, thanks. And you? Not too bad, not too bad. Well, I'm in cold winter, rugged up Sydney. How is things in Hoi An? Ooh, I am in hot, summery, sweaty Hoi An. <laughs> no, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed, no. <laughs> as far as the weather, anyway. So tell us a little bit about uh, how things have changed amid COVID. A lot going on in the news. So love to get your uh, recap on just what's going on in uh, Vietnam and, of course, your local Hoi An. Okay, so so what happened is uh, at the beginning of the, the what I could call the COVID crisis in, in March, April, actually Vietnam managed the situation really well and managed to trace uh, the few people who, who were tested positive so they, they, they managed to, uh, to handle the, the spread of the virus. And there was about three months, about three months of, of time in Vietnam when there was no COVID anymore. Uh, you could travel freely. There was not a single case recorded, tested. Uh, there was not a single death happening with COVID. And uh, something strange happened is uh, about 10 days ago, uh, they, they, they tested someone positive in Da Nang. And okay, no, no one knows where it comes from. This person was like, this person actually already passed away, but he, he was an old man who was already sick with like kidney disease and things like this. But no one really knows where this thing comes from. You know, people talk about illegal Chinese immigrant, but in Vietnam, it's, it's people always take shortcuts to start blaming the Chinese very quickly. So things to take with a pinch of salt. But uh, now they have, they, they are, so what happens now is since uh, four days, we are back into complete lockdown in Da Nang. Uh, in Hoi An, it's a semi-lockdown. But the difference this time is, is the first time it was a lockdown, but people were like going out a little bit and going to have coffee with friends and, and things were not being, I mean, people were, were following the rules, but it was pretty chill. This time I can really feel between the expat community and the Vietnamese people, everyone is taking things much more seriously. 
because yes. there, was, there was not a single case of COVID in Vietnam for, for a long time and it was like the pride of the country. And, and you can tell people really want to get back to this last three months when you could travel freely in Vietnam. Vietnam was like back to normal except for the international tourism. So everyone is really taking things seriously this time. People are staying home. Everyone's wearing masks. And uh, the government is actually testing uh, as many people as they can in the central Vietnam area. And I actually believe if they continue to do the job they do now, in, in a couple of weeks, we might be uh, uh, COVID-free again. Let's hope so. Uh, I think what I have admired the most about the Vietnamese government and the Vietnamese uh, people themselves is that they have been very strict on themselves. Uh, I mean, here in Australia, we have um, unfortunately some stories around people just, you know, taking things too lightly and being vagrant, and that has mm-hmm. caused outbreaks in particular in uh, Melbourne. But yeah. what I, I I do admire about the Vietnamese, and I think it, it, it actually – uh, leans to their fear of illness, which I know is very high. They fear illness almost, the you know, the highest thing that they fear in the world. So they go to all ends um, that I've noticed to, to avoid illness. So um, I really admire just the attitude and um, them being proactive and jumping on this really early. Yeah, and, and definitely the Vietnamese people are, are people who, who listen to what the government tell them. They, they, they trust in the government because, I mean, let's be honest, for the last 20 years, Vietnam has been doing really well. Yeah. So what people think is not to be critical towards the government so much because things are, do, are doing really well in Vietnam. And, uh, and Vietnam and like a lot of Asian countries, it's a, very, it's a more collectivist country. And in the West, in the West, we are more individualist. So we think about ourselves a bit too much. We tend to be a little bit more selfish and... And then it tends to, it happens, people say, no, I don't want to wear a mask because it's my freedom and really ridiculous things like this, yeah? Well, you, yes, you don't exactly. think like this in Vietnam, yeah? Because people understand it's for the good of, of everyone that everyone should yes. wear a mask. It's a collective, yes, agree. All right, now, you've been in the tourism industry for a long time and specialising in your photographic tours, which you do so well. I mean, just really quickly, how do you see Vietnam and tourism in the future? Like, you know, just if you if you were to crystal ball, what would you say? Are we going to have the buses outside the old town like we we have in the past? What are your thoughts there? Well, actually, I actually sold my crystal ball last year because I realized I was not good at, at, at using it a lot. Yeah. Good idea. Good idea. Uh, I was never good I, at it. Either. I'm really good at predicting things for the future. Honestly, I do not know. It it, it completely depends on. Um, on, the, on how the situation evolves around the world. Let's say if, if Europe and the US and maybe Australia is still stuck in a, in a COVID crisis, the first people to come back to Vietnam will be the Asian markets. And the Asian market is the one that is being shipped by bus and electric car through the old town and making the streets very busy with groups of people doing selfies and things like this, which is fine for the businesses located into the old town but every other tour business every little homestay located in the countryside around Hoi An things like this they don't really rely on this market to survive so for for Hoi An to be doing well like it used to we need Asian tourism and we need Western tourism but who knows when things will get back to normal if they ever get back to normal yes and what normal will look like in the future, I think, is um, up for grabs in anyone's language. Yeah, so let's the, concentrate on yeah, the definitely. stuff we do we do know about uh, and certainly what you know about, which is photography. And let's talk about your experience uh, in that area. And if you were to talk, talk to our listeners who are avid or keen travel photographers – what is it in Vietnam that would be most appealing to a travel photographer? Uh, so so the, the best thing about Vietnam, and I would say Southeast Asia in general, is mostly what people appreciate is the, um, the facility or how easy it is compared to the West to take photos of people. And this is something that is really, really amazing when you arrive in Southeast Asia is that you can take photos of people and you can interact with them and it's fine. Whereas in the West, people are very suspicious when you take photos of them, yeah? For, True. 
for the wrong reasons, I believe. People are a, bit, a little bit too paranoid, yeah? But so that's, that's one of the first things that people uh, enjoy when they come here and, and which is what I enjoy as well and which is the reason why our photography tours and workshops focus 99% on people photography and the art of approaching people to take their picture and to compose great images with the human element inside. The other thing people enjoy okay. here is how easy it is to travel around and you know you go around and you grab a bus and you grab a driver and you can go pretty much everywhere you want so you get the freedom of of traveling things are not restricted etc so you feel safe you feel free to travel where you want and it, it really helps when you you can focus on your photography then mm -hmm. and i mean i think our, our social media and all of our travel guides are absolutely always full of the most amazing scenery uh, photography. I mean, there is some amazing scenery. You and I have both seen um, that. Is, is that something that photographers also are keen to, to capture and, and to do well? Obviously, it's a different style and, and a different skill set. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Well, it's the the thing is, it's a little bit more. I mean, if you come from Australia and you're used to uh, driving an hour and find these huge, empty, wide landscapes where you can compose some really good sceneries, it's a little bit more difficult to find these things in Vietnam because there's a very high density of population on the coastline. So as soon as you're on the coastline, you will have electric wires in your pictures. You will have some big flashy signs in the background. There will be a little town or a little city that is kind of spoiling your, your your background there are some amazing spots um the difficult thing about vietnam is that we are facing east and if you want to catch the beautiful light you have to wake up really early to catch the sunrise because the sunset is over the mountains of laos and we usually don't have that an amazing sunset but the sunrise is just mind-blowing so it's a little bit more tricky you gotta wake up at 3 4 in the morning to catch a 4 30 4 45 sunrise you know what i mean mm -hmm. it's which is what we do on our photography tours because there is human activity as early as four in the morning in fishing villages and things like this, yeah? But um, it's a little bit more difficult. And, and I, I don't, sometimes I've tried. I've tried with my groups and I've tried myself. And I say, okay, this morning I'm going to take a landscape photo, yeah? And I arrive in the morning and I set up my tripod and I wait for the light to be good. But there's people going on around me and I'm thinking, oh, if I shoot that woman here in the water, that would be so nice. And I... I just forget about my, my scenery shot and, and, and jump on the people. Mm. So people is your love, is is that capturing them in motion. And I've heard you often speak about uh, the reality of photos rather than, uh, how shall I say, staged photos. I think mm -hmm. you've spoken quite uh, vividly about that. And I, I admire you for that because I think that's, that's reality. Um, so... And, I, and I've done one of your tours, which I loved, which was about creating and, and being able to take photos yeah, of real people in real life situations. And I, yeah. I, I definitely um, rate that highly. I'm going to jump in here and ask a big question. And, and I know some people hate answering it. But if, if I was to say to you, do you have like five, just five top places in Vietnam that you would say would be extremely desirable of a, a travel photographer to visit do you have five that you would recommend and we can actually go through one two three four five and we we can break them apart all later. right but do you have five all right all right so okay well my first choice would be obviously Hoi An okay because I'm based in Hoi An because I live in Hoi An anyone who has ever been to Hoi An or seen images of Hoi An you know that Hoi An is basically like a movie set the old town is just magnificent with its old uh, villas. All the walls are yellow. And it's still a mix of modernity and tradition in Hoi An. So, of course, if you go into the old town, I mean, one year ago, if you were going into the old town at 5 p.m., it would just be tourist everywhere. But if you go into the old town at 5 in the morning or 6 in the morning, it's basically Vietnam. There are no tourists. You are back into the real Vietnam. It's just amazing. The market is busy. People are very friendly. In between two photos, you stop on the side of the road to have some noodle soup and some good coffee. I mean, it's just so easy to travel and be in Hoi An. There's a choice of hotel, there's a choice of restaurant, there's a choice of spa. You can go have a massage in between two photo shoots. I mean, it's just so easy. 
So that would be my first choice. And that's why we run a lot of photography tools in central Vietnam. Uh, okay. starting so and, we'll put and, that down as number one. Okay. Number one. So number uh, two. Number two. Well, I don't know if I'm allowed to do that, but I'm just going to spread the, the area a little, bit, a little bit wider. And I would say the countryside around Hoi An, which is very highly unexplored. A lot of people come to Hoi An and stay in Hoi An. But if you drive 5, 10 kilometers outside of Hoi An, you are 20 years behind Hoi An. You suddenly reach this countryside where people have never seen a tourist before. It's just that easy. You drive 10 minutes on a motorbike and you are in a place where people have never seen a tourist before. And it's just then so easy to go and take photos there because naturally when you, when you are positive and you have a, a positive way of, of, of thinking and approaching people and you come with a big smile and you come and talk to the people and, and take photos and chat with them, people are very curious because they never see tourists here. So you, you don't have to, to do the work of approaching them to take their picture. They come to you already. Oh, what are you doing here? Are you lost? Which country are you from? And oh, why do you speak Vietnamese? Or how long have you been here? And, what? and boom, you don't have to do anything. People come and approach you. So it's so much easier to go and take photos of them because you don't have to deal with this, oh, maybe they don't want me to take photos of them. And now they just come to you already and smile. And so it's just make it so much easier. And it's something I recommend anyone coming to Hoi An to do is to mm -hmm. rent a motorbike or even a bicycle and to cross that giant Kwadai bridge, that new bridge yeah, on the river. And as soon as you arrive south of Hoi An, it is completely untouched in this whole area. And there's beautiful cultural aspects to that, as in farming um, and handcrafts and the markets. And so it's not just the people, but it's also their environments, isn't it? It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's where it's they really, live. And they're, they're carrying on as if um, time has forgotten them almost. You just jump, jump back in time. You do one more kilometre and it's like five years before and then you do five more kilometres and then you, you arrive in a field where they don't harvest the rice with a the machine. They're still doing it by hand. But two kilometers behind, you saw the machine, yeah? I mean, it's just the more you go, and the more you go towards the mountain area, towards Laos, the more you get back in time, more and more and more and more, yeah? So it's, it's just fantastic to travel there, and the people are, are so, so friendly. Yes, yes. So number three. Number three, which, which uh, I was about to put that into number two, but I put it in number three. But still, it, it should be number one, like really. It's, it's for me, it's the mountains of North Vietnam. Yeah. And, and, you know, once you go into North Vietnam and you see these mountains, you see these mountains which have, have been sculpted into rice paddies and the way the minority people have just modified the whole landscape to create this stunning, like for landscape photography, this is just amazing. But for people photography as well, there are a lot of markets and people in the field and minority villages. This is just we, we run photography tours in North Vietnam every year in September during the rice harvest. It's just still one of my favorite tours to run, even after eight years of going there every year or several times a year. It's just fantastic. I was there two weeks and, ago again. And, just, and, you know, it's funny you say, you know, you you go there several times and you still find something new, don't you? That's what I find about Vietnam. I go back in the same places, but there's just something new to, to discover. You're the, talking about... Yeah. Ha, and, ha, um, and ha Gaing and t can you give me locations where you go in North Vietnam specifically? Oh, well, North Vietnam, you can go, you can, from Hanoi, you can basically go to Lao Cai, uh, either with a, on the highway or with a train. And from Lao Cai, you either go left towards Sapa, which... Yeah. Sapa was a place to avoid from the last three, four years. Yeah, it's been overcrowded with Chinese and construction and it become ugly, full of concrete. But actually now is a really good time to go there. And I have a lot of friends who, who, li who live in Vietnam who are actually in the north right now. It's a fantastic time to travel in Vietnam now, if you can. I mean, until five days ago. Uh, because there are no international tourism and all the homestays are open. So you could basically travel through the country without any other tourists. Mm -hmm. But it's fantastic. But on, on, as you said, on a, it's changing every year. Every year you go and the field is different and, and mostly on a photographic point of view. On that day, the light is different and that field was busy with people. But then you come two weeks later, the field is gone. There's nothing. The light is different and they are doing something else on some other field or in the market. And there's always new things to find. And when it's about people photography... It's what I love about it. Yeah, A landscape is a landscape. If you wake up early in the morning, you set up your camera, you take a photo, then suddenly a cloud shows up. Well, there's nothing you can do. You just go home. 
people of photography, you can move around them. And if they're in the field and a cloud shows up and it starts raining, well, then you follow them. They will invite you to have some tea in their house. And then you can keep shooting in different environments. And, and it's just so dynamic and interesting. Yes, definitely. And let's face it, people make everything, don't they? Like because they have a personality, because they have um, a locality to speak to, they have a history um, and they have emotions. And I think that is what is most desirable in people photography, certainly mm -hmm. from my point of view anyway. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so I'm up to number four. What's your number four? Oh, number four, number four, number four. Let me think. I think for number four, I recently really fell in love with. So it's not it's not one particular area, but it's something I would recommend to any any tourist coming to Hoi An is to go and explore the coastline between Hoi An and basically Quinion. So Quinion is located south, basically. So, so we're Hoi talking Tam Ki. I'm talking from Tam Ki and heading south of that, the, the next 200 kilometers coastline, yeah? Ah, it's a yes. completely untouched area. Like Quinion, with yes. they start having tourists coming to Quinion. But if you go to Tui Hoa, if you go to any area between Quinion and Hoi An, it's just fantastic the things you can find over there. Yes. Yes, I was talking to someone about um, Tam Ki and Tam Tan Beach, uh, which yeah. is um, on that way. Yes. But you're right, Quinon is uh, is an area I haven't been to yet, uh, but it's one I, I certainly want to discover, and it does look so beautiful and so untouched. It is and really stunning. I mean, it's not it's not something I would I would recommend uh, any tourist to go, any traveler, because it's there's not much accommodation. Like for Western tourists, the restaurants you have to eat local because there is no tourism there. But for anyone who has an interest in photography, every single fishing village is mind-blowing. You can find salt fields. Uh, it's full of rice fields everywhere, corn, and, and the people are just so friendly. They never see foreigners there. So it's, it's, it's very easy to travel in these areas. It is developing, Etienne. Um, it is becoming uh, a little bit more, how shall I say, international tourist friendly there are some places being developed um Slowly. in those areas yeah uh, but let's hope it doesn't get overrun and yeah, but once and again it's the, same, it's the same thing someone will open a hotel in a in a town and someone will open another hotel in the same town but you go 10 kilometers to the next town there is nothing so it's, yeah. it's still very easy to get out as soon as the, the 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 tourism infrastructure happens somewhere it's still very easy to get out of this place Agree, agree. Okay, so number five on your list. Number five, I'd say Hanoi. Hanoi, just Hanoi oh, City. Hanoi. You know the old quarter in Hanoi around Huan Kim Lake? Yes. Early morning, yes. between six and eight Beautiful. in the morning. It's just the ladies pushing their bicycles, going to the market through the old villa. I know, I know you like this area a lot, yeah? It's just fantastic yes. to, to, to walk around Hanoi and either practice street photography or do fully travel photography. Uh, it's always a pleasure, always a real yes. pleasure. Yes. And, you know, that lake is, is quite unusual in the sense that uh, it, it has an atmosphere that goes with it. You know, people are dancing, people, you know, there's men playing checkers, there's... Uh, men doing you know, exercise on the lake, people exercise, doing... Exercise, yeah, love. and there's lovers that meet there. Yeah, it's delightful. It's got a, a lot got happening. A it's like there are basically thousands of people walking or running around the lake doing exercise. They actually block the traffic early morning. There is no motorbike, no cars. And along the lake is just people running and riding their bicycles. It's, it's, and everyone is in a good mood and having coffee and you walk around, take photos, and no one cares. Yeah, It's just very easy. So getting just very quickly, and I don't want to uh, get into this in a big way, but from a technical point of view, uh, what do you suggest for a travel photographer to bring as far as equipment? for well well let's say if they were to join you on a tour or they were to do a, a tour themselves you know what what would you advise well okay so th this is this this depends on on anyone's photography and what they like etc what i usually recommend when when people come from a lot of people come from australia on a tour and they message me before and what should they take etc 
what we do here, because we do people photography and because people photography is not fun until you know about your subject a little bit, I believe. Uh, I, I, I tell people just to leave their zoom lens at home, yeah? We usually tend to get close to everything because when you get close to your subject, you can interact with them, you can see what they do, you can move around your subject so you can compose many different images. If you were the big zoom lens, you would see something far away, you would point and shoot. And you, you're just not as creative in terms of composition as you are if you were with a 35 millimeter close to your subject where you could easily move right, move left, move up and down and change your composition instantly. And, and the people photography, if, if for me, it's, it's called travel photography. And the photography is important, but the travel is maybe more important. And if I take a nice photo of a man, but I don't have any interaction or any memory to myself for that, I just don't feel satisfied. I want to take a great photo, but I want to have a good laugh with this person. I want to know about them a little bit. And somehow I want to manage to give them something back. And giving them something back, which is not, I'm, I'm not meaning giving them money. I'm meaning having an interaction with them. So when I leave this interaction, they're happy and I'm happy. And usually, I mean, many, many of my students have witnessed this. And when you come from the West, it's really weird. But we go in a field and there are a group of people working and we talk with them and we laugh with them and we take their photos and then we leave and they say, thank you. Can you imagine that in the West, yeah? It's just impossible. Uh, yes, I can't imagine that in the West at all. Uh, I, it does bring up a subject that I even get asked um, around the expression of gratitude. You know, there are people that say, you know, should we uh, offer them some money? You know, should we pay them to take a photograph? You know, how, how do we do this respectfully? and uh, do this in a way that, as you say, from both sides, it is a wonderful experience and memory to take home. It's, it's a, so this is a really great area, and uh, I would reply to this question in a different way depending on who I'm talking to, but because I think your followers are Australian, so it's fine. I, can, I don't have oh, to give that I have got, I've right? got followers all over the world, Etienne. <laughs> yeah, not just Australia, thank goodness. I've got them from everywhere. Okay, okay. So I'll have to be careful then what I say. But no, it's a very yeah. great area. And, and some people get really sometimes upset when I reply. But what I tell people is you cannot show up in a place and think, oh, I have more money than them. And, and so I'm going to give them some money. It's just not the way the world works. And, and you're just giving people the wrong image. If you arrive in a village and in the countryside, no one will ask you for money, yeah? And you arrive in a village and you take a photo of this old lady on the, in the field and you think, oh, she's old and she looks poor. I'm going to give her some money. Yeah, but she didn't ask you for anything. And a lot of people do that because in the West, we relate everything with money. Well, well, that, that woman who doesn't really know, maybe she's never been to school much, you know, and then she's like, oh, foreigners give money. This is what they do. Boom. The next time I show up in the same field the day after, she's going to wait for me and say, give me money. And the experience will be spoiled, will be destroyed because she suddenly foreigner equals money. And, and you, you tend to give this idea to people that's okay. If, if a foreigner comes in the field and take your photo, he's going to give you some money, which it could be sometimes. I mean, sometimes I give money to people, but I give money to people when I know they need the money, when I've been talking with them, not just like giving them money because I took a photo of them and I feel bad because I took something from them and I feel I need to give them something back. But something doesn't have to be financial. It doesn't have to be material. Interact with them. Show them the picture and give them a good laugh. That's it. You give them something back. You created this interaction. And now they're like, oh, these foreigner people are really friendly. Yeah? They're actually getting their feet in the mud and they make me laugh. And they have a good experience with foreigners. So if you want to help the people, there are many other ways. You can work with a local NGO and give some money to this NGO that will help all the people in a certain area. But if you yourself, not knowing the people, show up somewhere and give money, you have more chance to destroy the place than to help anyone. Well, I think that's that's good advice. And I think, you know, um, it is a very individual thing. However, as you say, if you're going to set a precedent, um, maybe it's not a good idea. And there are some great NGOs in Vietnam to support. and. Um, I think um, from a holistic point of view, it's not just an individual. They're very community-minded. So it's more about what you can do to support a whole community when you're entering it, I think, um, exactly, is yeah. worth mentioning. And I mean, just, if, you give, um, if you give to the last to someone today, what are they going to do with it, you know? Is it going to help them? Exactly. Yeah. Not at all. 
exactly. Okay, so just just to wrap up, and I know that's probably a crazy question to ask you because you do run photography tours, but look, you know, for a traveller who has a real keen interest in photography and they want to to get the best out of Vietnam, do you do you recommend uh, people? you know, choosing to, to do a, a tour to include that as part of their visit or or do you think you can just, they can just make it up as they go along and, and as you say, hire a bike, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I have my own interpretation and, and, and uh, thoughts on that. Uh, I personally think uh, going with the tour is the way to go because sometimes you lose time in trying to find the right places where if you are with a guide uh, and a, a person, you know, like yourself that knows all the top spots uh, and knows how to get there quickly and efficiently and then can add expertise to what you're doing. So, in other words, you know, help me increase my skills at the same time. I think that's a win-win. But maybe maybe you have some broader thoughts. Do you think well, people can do it on their own obviously, or it's obviously. best to do it with a tour operator? Obviously, if, if anyone who's keen in, in photography uh, joins like a photography tour, which is, which is not a, a, how can I say that? Which is not a, a fake, you know, dodgy tour that someone made because photography tour was a popular keyword on Google, but something that really brings them to the right place at the right time of the day. Of course, it is the best way to do things. Where I would start to 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 differentiate from your answer is is for for people who are into photography here and don't want to uh, as you said hassle and find a location themselves and rent a motorbike and drive there which i would recommend people to try and do because getting lost is a great way to to travel but if people sign up just for a tour people find a local tour guide and tell them i'm interested in photography take me to the right place you know most tour guides they don't want to change the itineraries. They have their routine. They have their places. They know tourists like to go to this tourist place, and they will still try to take you to these tourist places. And I think even though you are clear with your guy that I want to do photography, I don't want to go where the tourists go, they will still somehow tend to take you to the place where the tourists go because it's just easy for them. So unless you find someone who really knows about photography, who really understands what you're looking for, uh, it, then it can make your life much easier. Uh, definitely. The way I travel myself is I do a lot of research before. So, for example, if I want to open a new photography tour, like what I did in Iran like three years ago, I do a lot of research about the country. The second thing I do, I check where the tourists go and where I don't want to go then. And then I contact <laughs> local photographers and I spend a lot of time on Instagram looking at photos of Iran. And I meet photographers who take photos that I think are really great. And then I get in touch with them. And I say, okay, I'm coming to your town. Can I? Can you meet me? Can you take me to these places? And a mix of information you can find online, a mix of information you can get from local photographers, and kind of mixing all this together helps me to to create my itinerary already. Uh, but mm -hmm. I've been most of the time. I found amazing locations not by finding them online, yeah, by by these local contacts who took me to places that just blew my mind. So I would recommend I people do that. Okay, so in wrapping up, we're going to say it's actually good to get lost <laughs> to find the best not, place. Not for too long, but it, 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 it's good, yeah. Absolutely. And people photography uh, is definitely something that's uh, – open to photographers in Vietnam as uh, some of the, the best shots um, taken in Vietnam are of, of the people. Mm. And for scenery, we're going to rate North Vietnam as the number one, as in, you know, your big panoramic shots. North Vietnam or... number one. I'd put the lagoons of central Vietnam number two. We have some amazing lagoons between Hoi An and Hue, where, where the sunrise is just phenomenal. Ah, yes. And from the High Van Pass, all that yes, is beautiful exactly. as well. Yes. Look, uh, I just want to say thank you very much, Etienne, for coming on the show. I'm thank sure you. everyone listening has got a lot out of this. Um, lovely to talk to you and catch up on just what's happening in Vietnam at the moment. Anytime. And um, <laughs> uh, good luck and uh, best wishes to your family. Stay well, stay safe, and um, we will be talking to you soon.
Okay, thanks, Kerry. We'll be uh, we'll be staying home for the next uh, days and see how the situation evolves here. But we are we are confident things will get under control soon. Great. Thanks very much, Etienne. Thanks, Kerry. Thank you, Etienne, for coming on the show. It's been great to talk through just so many aspects to uh, Vietnam and and the possibilities available for both the professional and the amateur photographer. For everyone, I have put uh, Etienne's uh, links to. Uh, Hoi An Photo Tours and Pics of Asia in the episode notes. Please don't forget to to share this podcast with your friends and family who who may be thinking about coming to Vietnam in the future. I mean, we're all in the position at the moment where we're we're researching, planning. Uh, so please put Vietnam on your map. It's a wonderful destination to visit. Uh, I look forward to talking with you in future episodes. Thank you uh, and be safe, everyone. Thank you for listening. Check out the episode notes for more information. What about Vietnam? Don't forget to subscribe, rate and review and stay tuned for more fun adventures in Vietnam. What about Vietnam?